Wasn't that awesome? Okay, my mic's not on. Uh, wasn't that awesome? Mic's still not on. All right, it wasn't that awesome? All right, good. My mic is on now. Good. Well, I always love when you start out a service and the first thing God tells you during worship is, Sean, do you want to have some fun today? And I'm like, yes, God, I want to have some fun. I want to do some fun things. So I don't know where we're going. Today's Father's Day. Amen? Amen. How many of you are born of a father? All right, we're all in the same boat here. We all have a f- earthly father who... Now, we recognize that Father's Day can be a difficult time for some, okay? It really depends on the relationship you had with your father, what kind of father you had. If, if he was a good father, or if he's still a good father, I guess, in the past or present tense. If you have a father who's good, you're going to have a great Father's Day if you get to be with him, if... If your father had some troubles and and your relationship was a little skewed, it might be a difficult time for Father's Day. If your father has passed on and is no longer with you, it can also be a time of sorrow and mourning. So we, we respect that. We know that. We know it's different for everyone. But we also know that fathers are a very significant part of God's plan to bring about his kingdom here on the earth. I'm going to share some stats with you later on, but fathers, you are important. You are very, very important. God has placed you in the family unit as the head. The Bible describes that we are the head of the family just as Christ is the head of the church. And that's not something to be lorded over or or anything, but it's it's a, a lordship of servanthood. Fathers, yes, we know we make sacrifices. A lot of the sacrifices we make, nobody ever knows about because we don't want people to know what we're doing. We just want to do the right thing. And fathers, you need to be commended for that. You need to know that God is pleased with what you are doing. You know, dads get a really bad rap in our culture. Let me give you a for instance. Can anybody name to me a television show or a movie where a father is presented in a positive manner? Last Man Standing. standing. There's one. I've never watched it, so I can't comment. (laughs) They canceled? Oh, that's the show they canceled. Little House on the Prairie and the Waltons. Okay. And that was 19... Oh, are they still on? (laughs) (laughs) Looking for happiness. I've never heard that or seen that. Yeah. Cool. So there are some out there that's good to hear. But I'm sure for the number that we name that are good, there's probably 100 we can name where the father gets a bad rap. The, the only uh, person that I've noticed who get a, gets a worse rap in television and in movies are pastors. If you've ever seen a pastor on a TV show, they're always the bad guy. Always. So, so that always is, is a direct giveaway. The only show that didn't, there was that, back in the 90s, there was that one about the pastor's family. What was it? Seventh Heaven. There you go. So there was one uh, where they kind of resented, or <laughs> didn't resent, they kind of showed it in a positive light. But this has actually been a systematic breakdown that the enemy has had in store for generations. You see, Satan knows one of the ways he can hurt humanity is by destroying the family. The family is the building block of culture. You can't have a society without families, and yet you look at our current age, they're doing everything they can do to make the opposite look normal trying to make what is doesn't work to make it look like, yes, this needs to be accepted. This is the balance. This is the normal. But we can see from even current statistics that it doesn't work. God laid the foundation of a culture and a society on the family unit. And in that family unit, we have fathers. So fathers, you are doing an awesome job. You have a pivotal role. And even though you don't hear it very often, keep it up. You're doing great. 
Now, based on our relationship that we have with our own earthly father, often can lead to uh, our relationship that we have with our heavenly father. If you have a good relationship with your father on earth, it makes it much easier to approach Abba Father, your Heavenly Father. If you don't have a good family or relationship with your father, there can often be things that inhibit or prevent you from reaching out and understanding who God is. Because God gave us a family model for many reasons, but one of the, the key reasons was for us to understand the relationship he wants to have with us. That's why Jesus called Father, Father. It's for us to understand that there's a relationship there. And then Jesus said, and we've talked about this recently, how you're no longer friend, uh, sons or no longer slaves, but now you're friends. And that there's a time where he wants us to experience him as Father God, that we are the sons and the daughters of God. So if we are the sons and daughters, he, he's the Father. You get that? You got you to gotta have this understanding because... You can't have a proper relationship with God with first out, without understanding that he is your father. He is your Abba father. Abba, the, the closest translation we have in English would be like daddy. Okay? That's how we're to approach him as our daddy. And, and I want to talk about today uh, nine lessons that I have learned of what it means to be a father from my Heavenly Father. Nine things my Heavenly Father taught me about being a dad. We have, as men, we have kind of the, the, the best and the worst. We have the absolute perfect example of what it means to be a father. Okay? We have that example. The problem is, it's perfect. And none of us are. None of us dads are perfect. We will make mistakes. But let me assure you, no matter what your relationship you had with your earthly father, you can experience the ultimate relationship with your heavenly father. God wants you to have that relationship, and he's done everything he could do to make it possible. So today I want to start off by watching a, a little video on fatherhood to get us in the mood. So Tyler, if you could cue that up. That really is a question, how much time do you have? Because being a dad is like no other experience on the earth. I've had the opportunity to be a father now for 18 years. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's amazing. I've gone from the point where I've seen my kids who were completely helpless and couldn't do anything for themselves to the place you see them grow up to where they're ready to take on the world. And there's no delight that is greater for a parent, specifically a father, to see your children succeed, to see your children grow up, and to accomplish things that, quite frankly, you couldn't accomplish yourselves. I have one goal in mind as a father, and this goal is that my children go deeper and farther than I ever could. I want to be a foundation which I can lift them up onto my shoulders that they can see farther than I could ever see. I want them to experience things in, in the Lord and in, in their personal lives that I may never experience. But I want them to experience it. I want to set the stage and I want to prepare the ground so that they can receive the promises that I so long to see. You see, I kind of look at this as, as the prophets of the Old Testament. They were sitting there looking at the future, seeing things that would happen, specifically around the coming of the Messiah. And Isaiah, when he prophesied, he could see the promise of the Messiah, but he himself would never experience it. But he could see it happening. I see a lot of things relating in our current age where there are things I see God wants to do, but I don't think my generation will actually see it. But I know it's my generation's job to lay the foundation so that the next generation can experience the fullness that God has for them. So I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to do whatever I need to do so that they succeed in areas where I have failed. That's my goal. That's my plan as a father. But one of the joys we have um, as a parent is we get to see our kids grow up. 
Now, I don't know what stage you're at right now. Uh, maybe your kids are old and adults. Maybe you kids, you're just starting out. Um, but the thing that is really common in, in, uh, as parents is your kids grow up so subtly, you don't even notice it. Can anybody testify to that? You're with them all the time. You're, you see it happening. And uh, if you meet somebody who hasn't seen you for, your kids for a while, all of a sudden, yeah, your kids have grown a foot. Really? I, I never noticed because it was so gradual. It's a process. But it's always good to look back and to see some things. And uh, those of you who know me, uh, I love being a videographer. I, I love taking videos even before the days of smartphones. I used to take videos of everything. So we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of home videos, literally. Um, and a few weeks, actually a few months ago, we just got the idea, let's start watching these things. We, like, we rec- I would record them, but I, we would never watch them. We would, so I have hundreds of hours. And, and we came across this little gem. And I'm going to ask Tyler to cue that one up right now, because this just touched my heart, because I didn't know that this was on the tape. <laughs> So now you guys know why we have so many animals in our house. But when you look at gems like this and and you reflect on what kids were like and then you see how they're now, it, it just impresses upon your heart how God does such amazing things. How God takes you out of situations. And today I want to quickly go over uh, the nine things that my Heavenly Father taught me about being a dad. See, the first thing we need to realize is that as dads, we are not perfect. And we do not have an expectation upon us to be perfect. We make mistakes. I have made several mistakes as a dad. Good thing God takes care of it. And I know I'll continue to make mistakes as a father. So we're not about looking perfection, but we are looking at about doing the best job we are able to do. And the lessons we learn comes from the lessons that our Heavenly Father has taught us. The first thing I want to deal with today is compassion. Psalms 103.13 says, Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Compassion, there's a reason why I put this at the top of the list. Because as dads, we need to be compassionate about our children. Far too often, uh, we we emphasize the the role of a disciplinarian uh, as a father. It's a father's role to discipline the children. And yes, I I do agree with that statement. But that shouldn't be what it's all about. That shouldn't be the entirety. We should also have an attitude of compassion. That means we have an understanding of our kids. Knowing that our kids, just like us, are imperfect. Imperfect. Our kids will make mistakes. And one of the hardest things as a parent is to watch your child make a mistake and not try to intervene, not try to stop it from happening. But there are times where we do need to allow them to experience things on their own so that they will get an understanding of where a built-in character inside of them. And this is the toughest challenge as a parent. Because nobody wants to see their child suffer. Nobody wants to see their child in pain. If you do, you shouldn't be a parent. Okay? But the thing is, it happens. We are in a fallen world, and there are difficulties that come our way. And specifically in those times, we need to pray and ask God, what is the role we play here? Are are we the role of protector? Are we the role of comforter? Are we the role uh, of supporter and encourager? Are we the one who has all the answers? Because we don't have all the answers, so that's a tough role to play. But number two, take the lead role in your spirit, kid's spiritual development. I believe this is the basics, the premise of when God said that the man is the head of the home. If the husband is the head of the home, I believe he needs to lead in spiritual development. I believe that it's up to the father to make sure that the children are raised in a godly manner. And this is something that has really gone astray because we have traditionally left uh, such matters to the mother. Or it's the mother who will do the devotions with the kids. It's the mother who will pray with the kids. Fathers, we need to take on that role. We need to be the head. We need to be the one that is teaching our children spiritual principles. 
In Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 to 9, it says, These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and daughters, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as signs to your hands, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. We need to be the ones who teach our kids. Don't expect the Sunday school program to teach your kids everything they know about God. Okay? Our Sunday school teachers are awesome. They do a great job. But they get maybe one hour a week with your kids. Growing in spiritual discipline takes a lot more than one hour a week to catch. We as teachers are here to supplement what you are doing in your home. But it's up to you to teach your children God's ways. We will help where we can, but don't leave it to our teachers. I want to relate some stats to you. Now, these stats are from the United States. They're not on the Canadian. I wasn't able to find any Canadian stats on this. But this is just talking simply about when the father is not taking the role of, of leader in his home. The way I see it reflected here, 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. That's five times the national average. 90% of all homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes. That's 32 times the average. 85% of all children who show behavior disorders come from fatherless homes. That's 20 times the average. 80% of rapists with anger problems come from fatherless homes. That's 14 times the average. 71% of all high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. Nine times the average. Children with fathers who are involved are 70% less likely to drop out of school. 75% of all adolescent patients in the chemical abuse centers come from a fatherless home. Ten times the average. 85% of the youth in prison come from fatherless homes. That's 20 times the average. Don't tell me fathers' roles aren't important. Fathers play the key role in how our society operates. For what you teach in your home, what you teach to your children, will be reflected in our culture and in our society. And when the, when the absence of the father in the home there, and this is not to disparage single mothers, okay? Single mothers work hard, okay? They do what they can. But the simple fact is, without the father being present, difficulties often arise, more so than if the father is there. So fathers, you play a pivotal role. Fathers, you play a major role in the development of your kids. Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Number three, live a life of integrity. Proverbs 20, verse 7 says, A righteous man who walks in integrity, how blessed are his sons after him. Integrity is a very valuable commodity in our current culture, in our current age. Men, we need to be men of integrity. That means the things we do, we do when nobody is watching. Our actions are the same. Our belief is the same. We need to be men of integrity. Why? Because you can't fool your kids. You can't. Your kids know every shortcoming you have. They do. They know. You can't hide them in your home. There comes a time where you need to reflect and make that decision that you are going to be a man of integrity that you are going to live the example that your kids can follow. I know, don't know firsthand of what it is to have a father of integrity. My father taught me integrity. That's where I learned it, is the example that he led, the example of who he was. 
And I am who I am today because of my father, because of the things that he did, for the example he showed. Number four, commit to the mother of your children. Genesis 2, 24 says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And then Ephesians 5, 25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. If you want your kids to have successful relationships in the future, love your wife and let your kids know it. Let your kids see it. If a son sees his father loving his wife, he will learn how to love his wife in the future. If a daughter sees her dad loving her mother, she will know what to expect of her husband in the future. And she won't settle for anything less. And that is a huge problem in our current culture, is we have many young ladies who are growing up without a father, so they don't know what to expect out of their husband. And as a result, they get the garbage that they get. Man, it's up to us to present the example for our kids so when they meet a man who doesn't measure up, they just keep walking. They don't have that desperate desire and need that has to be met, and so they're willing to use anybody to meet that desire. It'll give them a higher standard and a higher calling. I pity the young man who wants to date my daughters. I'm praying for them every day. I, I do. I seriously, I pray for them every day. But they better reach a certain level. They better have a certain standard. They better have a certain level of walk and talk and integrity before they get anywhere near my daughters. It's not going to happen. Because these are my daughters. And I have spent my life grooming them so that they can be the women that God has called them to be, deserving of the man. Amen? Amen? So love your wives and show it to them. Display it for your kids to see. It will have eternal results in their, in their relationships down the road. Number five, recognize your children are gifts from God. Psalms 127, 3 to 5. Behold, children are a gift from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the one whose quiver is full of them. They will not be ashamed. They will speak with their enemies in the gate. Children are a gift. Sometimes they don't act like it. Sometimes we need to remind them, child, you are a gift from God to me. Yes, look at your kids right now. Tell them, you are a gift. This is something we, as parents, we need to get a, a regular occurrence, right? Reminding your kids that you're a gift, okay? God gave you to me. Now, there are people in this place um, who, who can recognize this firsthand where if you've had trouble conceiving, you understand this in a far more better way than those of us who, who never had to deal with that. You understand the, the, the desire and the promise, and when that comes, it's a fulfillment. There are also people in this place who are desiring for that time to come. And, and look at this. As this, is, this is a time where God is grooming you so you can understand the gift that is coming. And I believe fully and I'm going to speak this out again, that there is coming an anointing on this church where every a couple who, who wants to have children will be able to have children. There will be no restrictions on that. And, and I believe as a church, we need to pray this in. I believe that we need to be in agreement together. We need to pray for these couples, lift them up so that we see the promises of God's blessings come because it's God who gives the gifts. Okay, it's not the body. It's not a physical reaction. And, and people can say, oh yeah, it's just genetics. You get two people together and it creates a baby. No, where does the soul come from? Where does the spirit come from? God is intimately involved in the process. Okay, He is bringing life to that. You, you, you can't just put cells together and call it life. There's more to it, but that's a whole message under itself. Number six, Slow to get angry, abounding in love. Exodus 34, 6 says, And then the Lord passed by in front of it and proclaimed, 
The Lord, the Lord your God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Yes, dads, let's be honest. There are times when we get angry with our kids. Don't raise your hand. Don't say amen. Okay. There are times when it happens. It's important that we are, are men who are slow to angry like our God. Okay. Giving our kids the grace that God has given us. But that doesn't mean that we allow them to run rampant and to do everything they want to do and they're the children and we're the, we're the cleanup crew, I guess. Because number seven is discipline your children. Amen. 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 Come on, kids, let's hear it. Discipline your children. Ephesians 6, verses 1 to 4 says... Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you, and that you may live a long life on the earth. And then there's a warning to the dads. Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger, and bring them up in the discipline and instructions of the Lord. This provoking your kids to anger, I really wish that wasn't there. I... I, I have a gift. It really is a gift. I can get my kids rattled right to the edge, and Shirley's like, you're not supposed to provoke your kids to anger. I'm not making them angry. I'm just expanding their character. (laughs) It's a gift. But fathers, we do need to discipline our children. And we have a, a culture that is quickly turning around on that and they want they think every child should be able to make whatever choice they want and grow up and do what they want because they're small they're independent and the word that they keep learning leaving out of that is ignorant kids don't know everything can you imagine what you would have done as a child if you had no restrictions some of you did and you paid the price for it We don't want our kids to pay those same price. We want them to learn from our mistakes. We want them to learn from our wisdom, right? The definition of a fool is that you keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. We don't want that to be a generation of fools where we make a mistake, then our kids make the mistake, and then their kids make the mistake. and That's not the way it should be. We need to teach the next generation the things we have learned, the lessons we have learned, so that they can go farther than we can. Because if they can learn from us, they don't have to experience the things we've experienced, so they can just be ahead of the game. And that was God's intent from the very beginning. So that means we need to teach our kids discipline. We need to teach our kids that you don't get everything you want when you want it. Is that good advice? Is it? Why? (laughs) I'm going to leave that there. Um, Let you think about that one. There comes a point where we have to be able to reflect on our children the promises that God has given to us. That means teaching them to walk in the precepts that God has laid forth. Teaching them to do right. And this really comes down to the basics of understanding of what sin is. Okay? The reason why God hates sin so much is because sin is destructive to his children. Get that? The reason why God hates sin is because it destroys his children. We take it and we think, oh, sin just stops me from doing the fun things. No, sin is to steal, kill, and destroy you. Nobody wants your kid to be stolen from. Nobody wants your kid to be destroyed. Nobody wants their kids to go through this harm. So it really comes down to us saying, hey, that's not going to happen to my kid. 
I'm going to teach them to make right choices because it's your job as a parent to raise them up to a place where they make right right choices because you're not going to make those right choices for them their entire life. Yeah, when they're an infant, when they're a baby, yeah, you make the decisions of when they sleep. You make the decision of what food you shovel in their mouth. And and some of our kids are going to resent us when they get older and find out what we shove down their mouth. Um, Where's Tyler's upstairs? I'm going to tell a story of my son. His favorite thing as a baby was plain yogurt with broccoli. Yeah. You know what I'm thinking. And we as parents just kept feeding it to him. Yeah. Yeah, he loved it. All right. Discipline your children. The next one, number eight, teach them forgiveness. I want to show you this next uh, video on the prodigal son. Teach your children forgiveness. Forgiveness is caught more than it's taught. We all make mistakes. I know that as a young man in high school, I made one of the dumbest mistakes a person can make. One of the stupidest things to do. And yet, instead of my parents reacting in a way that they should have acted and disciplinary and that, they showed me grace and mercy and love. It's a tough call. It's a tough decision. But you see, I learned forgiveness through my parents. I learned what forgiveness meant, not only to give it, but to receive it. And number nine, be your child's greatest encourager. Deuteronomy 31.6 says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them, for the Lord your God is the one who goes before you, and he will not fail you or forsake you. Dads, encourage your kids. Build them up all the time. You see them do something, commend them. You did a great job. Keep doing it. Give them the, all the confidence that they need because they're, they're in a world that will constantly tear them down. They're in a world that will often degrade what they do, which will often pull back and, and, and put it down. Don't believe me? Just go visit any elementary school or, or any school or any playground and, and just see how kids treat each other. Okay? The place where kids need to be safest is in their home. That means as a dad, we need to encourage them. And sometimes we need to encourage them to do things they don't think they're capable of doing. I want to end with this uh, little story. Tyler, if you can put up Great Sand Dunes. Uh, Many of you know our family loves to do uh, adventurous things. And we've been doing this with our kids since a very young age, and they kind of got dragged along no matter what we did. Now, this is in Colorado. If you ever get a chance to go there, it is amazing. Um, That is all sand. It's a sand dunes upon sand dunes. Now, when you first look at it, that, that gives you a little bit of perspective where the people are standing and then in the background you can see and you can actually see a few people walking up the right-hand side. So that shows you the distance. It's a massive hike. It's about uh, 1,500 feet from the bottom to the top. And that doesn't sound like too drastic of a hike until you realize you're walking on sand. So every three steps forward, you slide two steps back, okay? It's fun. We loved it. Now, when the day we were there, it was in the 30s, about 32, 33 degrees, which was a warm time for what normally is there. But what the interesting thing is, the sand can get up to 150 degrees Celsius, okay? So as you're walking on the sand, you can't walk in bare feet. You have to have some kind of covering on your feet. Um, Tyler, if you can start up the, the little video clip. But it was a very interesting time because we started at the base and we just kept driving the kids that you can make it. And they're like, no, we can't do it. Look how big it is. It's huge. It's way up there. I'm like, okay, well, let's not worry about the top. Let's just worry about the first set of dunes. Let's get to the first height. So we started walking and we started climbing and and trying to make a game out of it. But when you're you're doing that much exertion, it's not always easy. We would take a lot of breaks 
And it, it was just a fun time. I remember using it as a teaching thing with the kids, with the girls. Like, yeah, you can do this. You can, no, I don't want to make it. I don't want to go. I'm like, well, we can't leave you here, so you have to make it. you got to come. You can do this. You can get to the next one. And it, it was just an amazing thing because as we would climb, uh, we would just get farther and farther. But it was really disheartening because you get to the top of one dune and you'd see another one. You climb to the top of that one and you'd see another one. And this went on for hours and hours and hours. And we took a lot of breaks. We drank a lot of water. It was this trip that decided that we were going to get each one a camel pack uh, because the little water we were carrying was not enough. And we kept marching. We kept climbing. And finally, we accomplished our goal. And we got to the very top of the peak. And it was amazing because you could look over the, all the valleys and you could see everything from this one point. There was Cassie doing the splits at the very top of the peak. Now the fun part of here was running down the hills. Where you would run, you would jump, and you could jump as far as you want and there was no fear of getting hurt or, or anything because uh, the sound would just absorb your, your impact. So we would run down these and we finally got back to the base. We, we accomplished our goal and we won. It was a great teaching episode uh, until we got back to the ranger station and we started talking to them and they're like, well, there's only about a dozen people a day who actually make it to the top. And they're like, we don't think any little kids have ever made it up there. And our kids were like, this was in 2009, so they were quite young. They were quite little and they just kind of looked at us like, are you insane? Like, <laughs> and we're like, well, the kids didn't know about it beforehand. <laughs> But this is just an example of, you know what, when, when you're on your own, you don't think you can accomplish certain things. But when you have somebody in your corner supporting you, encouraging you, you will go farther than you ever think you can go on your own. And fathers, that is your biggest role. And that's why I left this for last. Your biggest role in your child's life is to be their biggest encourager. To tell them they can do the impossible. To tell them they can do things beyond anything that they think they are capable of. Sometimes they need a push, yes. And that's our privilege too. But other times we just get to see them blossom and grow and accomplish amazing things. And, and that's the privilege of being a father. Is we get to see the advancement of the kids. Now I would like to call um, all the... Yeah, R R TJ, can you start that last video? Um, and as we're, we're watching this last video, I want all the dads to come up to the front. You got this. So come on, stand up if you're a dad in the house or if you're a dad to be wanting to be a dad. Come on up. You got this.